Kamala Harris is now the Democratic nominee, and some Democrats are relieved that Biden has been replaced. But Elizabeth Nolan Brown, my colleague at Reason Magazine, thinks that relief might be short-lived. Brown has been covering Harris for years, and she penned a recent article detailing the reasons that Harris historically has been unpopular. In her piece, Nolan writes, quote, It's hard to conclude that Harris would fare worse than Biden. Yet, if one recalls Harris's own ill-fated run the, the Democratic national, for the Democratic national nomination in 2020, and her time in politics before then, the math in this equation becomes somewhat fuzzier. Harris was a truly bad candidate, and prior to that, she perpetrated some truly bad policies. Here to dive in further on what we can expect from Harris on the road in November is Elizabeth. Thanks for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me. So Biden himself ran some bad presidential campaigns in the past. He's had to drop out before because he couldn't overcome such bad things. And he became the president. So can we see a turnaround from Kamala this time around? Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't think it's impossible, although, you know, she's got going she's got it going against her. The fact that she's inheriting everything bad about the Biden campaign, except for his age. Right. I mean, she's closely tied to every policy that people already didn't like about Biden. And then she also brings a lot of her own baggage to to this campaign, um, both from her time as a district attorney and attorney general in California and from her from her more recent um, you know, exploits on the national scale. So let's get into her record as her involvement in the criminal justice system in California, because obviously when she tried to run for president in 2020, she attempted to shed that skin because the national moment was very much about uh, George Floyd and reckoning with police violence. And she tried to pretend she'd always been this deeply progressive person, progressive prosecutor. And I, I think in your reporting, you've shown how that just was totally not true or a, a sincere belief of hers at, at all. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, when she was a district attorney in, in San Francisco, she actually ran to the right of the existing district attorney. She um, she did speak a lot of sort of, she gave a lot of lip service to being a progressive prosecutor, but then once in office, she was, you know, much tougher on crime, on, on all sorts of crimes too, not just on, you know, the kind of crimes you might think that everyone can agree that we want to be tough on, but she, you know, she cracked down on, you know, people for, for marijuana, she cracked down on people for consensual prostitution, she ca cracked down on people for loitering, for truancy, you know, um, when your parent, when you're, parents are of kids who are absent from school. She wanted to put truant parents in jail. She cracked down on people for owning guns and, and you know, not restoring them properly and all sorts of things. So things things that both the left and the right uh, would not like being cracked down on. And, and just in general, on misdemeanor quality of life crimes, she was she really was, you know, much tougher on those than than the already progressive prosecutors there, which, you know, sometimes more moderate people might like. But I think the problem is that a lot of people on the on the left don't like her because of this. And then she's also spoken so much lip service to progressive justice, though, that that gives a big opening for the right and for moderates to hit her on that. Say, no, actually, she's this radical because she's, you know, talked like that. Now, Kamala Harris's campaign in 2020 was criticized from the left. It sounds like a lot of members of the right, the tough on crime party that's been complaining about the crime wave and attorneys general who will not enforce the law, they're talking about Kamala Harris's record as well at a time when the left is unified in a pretty unique way against a Democratic presidential candidate in a way I haven't seen before, not since Bernie Sanders. And so it's interesting that the right is seemingly making points that make her more attractive to the people who are, are interested in this tough on crime narrative and having a president who's tough on crime. Do you see this really being a problem in an environment where she's not running against someone to her left, but someone to her right? I don't see it as being as much of a problem as it was in 2020, because obviously that was a Democratic primary. Um, you know, this may have alienated some Democratic voters who might not have her be their top choice for a candidate. But yes, like you said, like compared to Donald Trump, they're probably still going to pick Harris over Donald Trump. Um, but, you know, this could alienate some people who might not vote for either of them. Um, some independents, definitely some libertarians, um, you know, or just some more you know, Democrats who are more concerned with civil liberties and with criminal justice report issues, I think that it that it could, you know, cost her some of those votes. They might decide to vote independent. They might decide to vote for um, libertarian candidate Chase Oliver. They might decide not to vote because, you know, there is a lot of a lot of um, antipathy towards Harris amongst 
amongst the left. But um, I I don't think it will be as big of a deal in this issue, in this because it is not a primary, it is a general. And because, like you said, we are sort of at a different moment with regards to criminal justice reform than we were in 2020. I mean, I just think she's remarkably untested up to this point because she did not actually perform that well in the 2020 primaries and because of the way this no, has horribly. worked. Right, she did not do well. And now she's been thrust into this role by largely by Democratic elites and big donors who didn't want Biden anymore, which is not to say there was like tons of enthusiasm for Biden among the base um, either. But, you know, here she is. I mean, the task of winning the election, right, is introducing her to swing voters in the Midwestern uh, states that <laughs> you and I are from. You know, you're in, you're in Ohio. I'm from yeah. Michigan. You know, selling her to those people. And I think it's very much an open question whether she will be, uh, whether, whether those kinds of voters will be interested in her when she, like you said, has a lot of the, still is tied to, associated with the failures of the Biden administration. And in some ways, on, on a couple issues, I think she comes across as, more progressive in an alienating way on um, maybe, for instance, energy issues. Um, you know, she's obviously leans into the aspect of her I identity and all of that, which is exciting for uh, progressives and, and liberals for a black woman to come so far and all of that, but doesn't necessarily get you anywhere with the kind of voters that they need to win in the swing states. Yeah, I mean, I think with those people, like, you know, what the things we were just talking about, the criminal justice stuff is not going to matter with, with that audience. I think more so the problem that she has is, is that, you know, people don't know who she is. And there's this sense that you can't know who she is because she flip flops so much. She's vague. She changes her position or she just won't commit to any sort of position. And this is going back to her presidential campaign in 2020. This is going back to her run for attorney general of California. This is the longstanding feature of Harris is that it's just, you know, sort of impossible to tie her down. So I think people rightfully sort of get this idea that she's sort of slippery, that she might be sort of phony, that it's hard to know what she actually stands for. And people bristle at that, you know, um, for all of Joe Biden's flaws and for all the, you know, the kind of whoppers he actually did tell, he had this quality of seeming very authentic and seeming like someone you could trust. That was at least his demeanor. And I think for, you know, normie voters who weren't paying too close of attention, that really resonated. And I'm not sure that Harris has that same sort of authenticity and trust that, that Biden did. I don't know. I'm going to be honest. A lot of these criticisms of Kamala Harris don't feel very real. Of course, you can watch her speeches and get to know her. She spent all of last week campaigning across North Carolina, the state that I'm from. I've seen a lot of Republicans and conser conservative leading voters that are really independent thinking. They, they like her. They like what she has to say. On the other side, you have Donald Trump, who hardly ever commits to a, a, a policy promise, whereas in 2020, we had Kamala Harris speaking about lowering taxes for working class and middle class families, talking about giving teachers a pay raise, ending the filibuster to get New Deal type policies. She spoke about affordable health care and a path to a public option. So I can name a handful just based off of watching her speak last week and knowing her from 2020. So I don't know, it feels like conservatives are sort of throwing mud and nothing seems to stick. What do you think the, the real qualms of a swing voter in a swing state, someone who's independent minded that would go for Trump over Harris? Well, I mean, like you just said, you, you've seen her say these positions, but a lot of these things she is not consistent on. I mean, during the 2020 election, she was for Medicare for all, then she wasn't for Medicare for all, then she was for it. She criticized Joe Biden for his busing policies, but then it came out that she was also opposed to those busing policies. I mean, there's a lot of things that she says in the moment, and depending on who the audience she's talking to, she says what they want to hear, but then you go back and look at her past statements, or you give it another week and she's saying something totally different. So I think that's gonna be one of her big liabilities is just, you know, no matter what she says, it might sound good in the moment, but there's not a lot of consistency there. I feel like I could apply all of that to Donald Trump though. Do you see what I'm saying? Oh, of course, yeah, definitely. I mean, this isn't, I'm not here to try and convince anyone to vote for Donald Trump either. Um, you know, I think that this is partly just talking about, I think it's good that people go into this with a clear uh, view of who Harris is, you know? I'm not saying that it's gonna make anybody wanna vote for Trump instead. I'm not, I, you know, not a fan of Trump either. I will not be voting for Harris or Trump. But I think that, you know, right now there's this rush to sort of portray Harris as this, you know, um, almost, you know, mythically good figure because everyone, you know, wants her to be Trump on the left and also many moderates and, you know, independents want her to be Trump. But 
it's it's important that we that we look at her clearly. It's not saying that people shouldn't maybe vote for her still, but it's saying like let's be honest about her flaws because you know if we're just gonna pretend like she's just gonna you know be this perfect candidate, that's that you know the record does not indicate that. The record yeah. indicates that she's got some authoritarian tendencies too. She's not the anti-Trump. Yeah, and these flaws have been on display in the past. Like I agree, she certainly could win the the general election. Um, I. Am reasonably persuaded that she has better chances, maybe, than Biden. Although, again, Biden has a long track record of actually winning elections, and she does not. And you know what sounds good to Democratic elites on paper or like very plugged-in media people is not always the way swing voters in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin are thinking about things. So I'm I'm open to the idea that she's going to really overperform relative to how she did last time. She's going to reintroduce herself to the American people, and she'll be this compelling figure. Do I, I think that's absolutely possible. It's just not really what we've seen for her from her so far in the past. And when you talk about things like, you know, some of her past with with the truancy thing, I mean, there are things like that, that that are that, that is a criminal justice issue, but that is going to resonate with moderates and swing voters. The fact that she wanted to put the parents of kids whose children were absent from school in jail. I mean, that's the kind of thing that's going to come back to bite her. And this wasn't just like a one time thing. She wrote in her, her 2019 book that one of the reasons she wanted to be attorney general was so she could implement a statewide truancy policy. Now, again, you know, that doesn't really have anything to do with with, you know, being the president of the United States. But I think that that's the kind of thing that, you know, is going to be used against her, is going to be brought up again and again and is going to alienate moderate Midwestern yeah you know, average voters. Well, I'm choosing to be unburdened by what has been and hopeful for what can be. <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth Nolan Brown, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you.